And do, are there many legal grounds for Elon Musk to stand on here? Uh, it doesn't appear like it. I mean, obviously, I don't know what I don't know. I don't know what facts he might develop um, as court proceedings continue. But at least based on what's been stated publicly, he's offered a number of grounds to argue that Twitter has breached its obligations and therefore he's entitled to walk away. And so far, they really just don't seem that substantial. So he claims that Twitter misled him about the spam on the platform. That's what's getting all the headlines. But he's not offered much evidence that it did mislead him. And even if it did, even if the spam counts were wrong, that's actually not a basis for walking away from a merger. He would have to show not only that they were wrong, but that they were dramatically wrong and were having some kind of long-term effect on Twitter's finances. And that kind of showing just, it hasn't been made. There's no evidence that that's the case. Um, yeah, so each one of his grounds, yeah. just they don't see that substantial. Talk to us about the legal precedent here, because if they rule in Twitter's favor, what happens? I mean, do, can they really force someone to buy a company? And, and then what occurs? Well, that's exactly the issue. I mean, I think that most people, at least watching from the outside, think that uh, Twitter is a very strong case. The question is, what happens after Twitter is found correct? Then, then what? What do we do? Well, they've signed a contract. And the contract basically says that there are two possibilities. One possibility is specific performance, meaning Musk is ordered by the court to follow through with his obligations and actually acquire Twitter. And the other is that Musk pay a breakup fee of a billion dollars. Obviously, Twitter would much rather he buy the company because <laughs> he's promised to pay 44 billion and that's bigger than 1 billion. So the question is whether a court can and will really order Musk to go through and buy the company. And Delaware has done that. There have been several occasions in the past where buyers got cold feet and they wanted to walk away, and a court said nope, and ordered that they actually go through and buy. But this case is much bigger. It's a much bigger dollar figure on the deal, and it's a company that has this huge social footprint. And there's a real question as to whether a court will think it's appropriate to force an unwilling buyer to buy a company that's so um, important socially uh, over his own objections. But then the alternative, at least contractually, is just a billion dollars, which doesn't seem right either. Yeah, and, and to that end, how much do the judges, the lawyers involved, have to paint a picture of what has been lost for Twitter, financially as well? Because fundamentally, obviously, the picture has pay changed since he first made the offer, and we all understand that, and some would hypothesise that this is all just a way in which to renegotiate the terms of the deal rather than walk away entirely. But this is also, you know, they've lost key talent. How can you assign monetary value to that? Well, that's exactly why uh, uh, parties contract to say there should be specific performance, meaning that must have must has to go through with it. it, because you can't put a dollar figure very easily on it. Mm. So that's why Twitter and Musk agreed ori originally that the proper remedy would be to order him to close, because there's no way exactly to put a dollar figure on it. And even if Twitter were to try, they would run into the fact that they've already agreed that if it has to be a dollar figure, a billion is the most they can get. So it's really kind of complicated whether the court is willing to order specific performance. If it's not, is it going to be stuck with a billion dollar cap or will it actually try to assess the amount of damage to Twitter, which could be much higher? And of course, I feel like this is going to go down in the history books, but also the legal, uh, the legal education books of what we've now learned. We all knew this was an, from day one an extraordinary offer, an extraordinary deal, and uh, and a very extraordinary person at the top, sort of leading and driving this. From your perspective, does anything change? Do you think this makes companies act in a different way when they have become a target? Well, I mean. I, Elon Musk is so uh, singular. I mean, nothing about this deal unfolded the way deals normally do. Um, this sort of overnight purchase where he was pressuring the company on Twitter and it was signed almost immediately. I mean, if there's any lesson here, it's that if you have sort of an erratic buyer to be a little bit more careful, at least in the drafting of, of the merger agreement, which is otherwise very tightly drafted, but I mean, the billion dollar damages cap, maybe they shouldn't have included that part. Um, but I'm not sure how many lessons there are for the future because I'm not sure how many impulsive buys of a 44, for $44 billion of a public company you ordinarily see. I mean, it's the the oddity of the purchase and the, and the impression that Musk gave that he was buying it not for financial reasons but simply because he wanted it personally that make this so extraordinary and so hard to figure out what the next steps are. And of course, everyone quips, "Oh, the only winners are the lawyers, are they?" <laughs>
Um, well, they'll certainly do pretty well. Um, if, I, I think Musk will pretty much win if he gets to walk away from this for a billion dollars and nothing more. I mean, because you know he signed an agreement and, and, and created this chaos for this company. And if the only thing he has to pay, I mean, for me, a billion dollars would be quite a bit, but for Elon Musk, it's, you know, what's under his couch cushion. So, um, so for he, I think, would make out pretty well if that's all that he had to pay. Um, otherwise, I, he, he ends up with a company. <laughs>